This is the second lecture on buses for COMP 375 Computer Architecture and Organization at North Carolina A&T State University. Here's a diagram showing the block transfer. We covered this in the previous lecture. Uh, at the top, we have the clock. You'll notice that the clock goes on and off. It doesn't go absolutely straight on and off. Instead, it's at an angle. That's because it takes a certain amount of energy to go up and down and turn it on or off. And to go on and off at exactly no time, it would take an infinite amount of energy. So there's slightly different. And remember, these are nanoseconds or, or less than a nanosecond, so they're moving pretty quickly. The second line shows the address. In other words, at time one, the CPU put the address on the bus. And then at time three, this, the memory responded, sending information to the bus, or excuse me, sending information to the bus and the CPU at uh, four separate periods to send four block transfers. There was a wait period in time two between when the CPU provided the address and when the memory responded to send the information. This is obviously a dedicated bus because at the same time, we have both address and data on the bus. And that couldn't be done with a multiplex bus that shares the wires. Okay, we want to know how long is each clock cycle. That is how many seconds per cycle or fractions of a second per cycle. Hertz is cycles per second. So we just have to invert the cycles per second to get seconds per cycle. So if we have two gigahertz, that's two times 10 to the ninth cycles per second. And we invert that, we get 0 0.5 times 10 to the negative ninth seconds, which is half a nanosecond. We'll be talking about transferring information across the bus. Buses are usually measured in how many bits wide or how many bits they can transfer in a single cycle. We're usually transferring data, referring to it as bytes. There are eight bits per byte. So if we look at the number of bits being transferred in a cycle and divide it by eight, we'll get the number of bytes being transferred every cycle. And then if you know how many bytes you want to transfer and you can divide it by the number of bytes Per cycle, you get how many cycles it will take. Here's an example. Say we want to know how many clock cycles does it take to transfer 96 bytes over a 128 bit wide bus. Well, 128 bits divided by 8 is 16 bytes per cycle. So we can transfer 16 bytes every click of the clock or every cycle. So if we want to transfer 96 bytes, divide that by 16 bytes, and we get six cycles. So we'll take six cycles to transfer the information. But most memory systems have a delay between when the CPU first gives it the address and when the data is available. So if there was a four cycle delay, meaning the transfer started on the fifth cycle, then we would add the four cycles to the six and get a total of 10 cycles to get the information to the CPU. Pause as necessary. Okay, we have a 32 bit wide bus. Dividing that by 8 bits per byte shows us that we can transfer 4 bytes per cycle. So every cycle of transferring information, we can transfer 4 bytes. Well, we wanted to transfer 64 bytes, so we divide the 64 bytes by 4 bytes per cycle, and we get 16 cycles. So it would take 16 cycles to transfer 64 bytes over a 32-bit wide bus. I have a wide range of questions I ask about buses, but I have a limited number of bus pictures. So in general, the bus picture will, may or may not be accurate to the problem. So 
you can't, can't look at this and say, oh, it'll take five time cycles because there's five time cycles in the picture. The bus we're using here is 64 bits wide. So if we divide 64 bits by 8 bits per byte, we get 8 bytes per cycle. We want to transfer 32 bytes, so we can divide 32 bytes by 8 bytes per cycle, and we end up with 4 cycles to transfer the information. Since it was a 3 cycle delay, that is, the transfer starts on the 4th cycle, meaning there's 3 cycles before the transfer starts, we add 3 to the 4, and we end up with an answer of 7 cycles to transfer the information from when the bus or from when the CPU first requested the information. Well, if we have a one gigahertz bus, we can find out how many seconds per cycle by inverting one times 10 to the ninth, and we get one times 10 to the negative ninth seconds per cycle. It's a good thing to remember that a one gigahertz bus has one nanosecond cycles. So if you have a faster bus, uh, say two gigahertz, then it would be half a nanosecond. Or if you had 500 megahertz, then it would be two nanoseconds per cycle. So kind of remember that one gigahertz is one nanosecond. And since the one nanosecond cycles, uh, so if we have seven of them, that's simply seven nanoseconds. It requires two memory axes of seven nanoseconds. So if there's two instructions at seven nanoseconds per instruction, we get 14 nanoseconds per instruction, multiplying the two times the seven. We want to know instructions per second. Since we know seconds per instruction, we can simply invert. So we invert the 14 times 10 to the negative nine seconds, and we get 71.4 times 10 to the six instructions per second. That's 7.14 million instructions per second, or MIPS. MIPS used to be a very common measurement performance, although it isn't particularly accurate as a measurement of performance. Another issue about buses is how do you decide who gets to access the bus at any given point? There may be multiple devices, multiple I.O. controllers or the CPU trying to access the bus all at once. But only one of them can be putting information on the bus at a given time. So they have to determine who gets to use the bus. And there are many different ways to do this. You can group them into centralized arbitration and distributed arbitration. In centralized arbitration, each device makes a request to some central arbiter. In other words, when they want to uh, use the bus, they send a request on the request line. And when the arbiter decides that it's their turn, it will send a grant message across on the grant line. So that device can then use the bus until it's done, and then it will drop its grant and next device can access the bus. For older systems, particularly I think of old IBM 360s and uh, more modern systems of that, they had daisy chain buses. That is, the cables from the computer went to each device in turn. And so if the first device on the bus wanted to use the bus, then it could use it. If it didn't want to use the bus, then it would send the request to the next device on the chain. If that wanted to use it, then it could. If it didn't want to use it, send it to the next one and the next one. So the last device can only access the bus if all the previous devices did not wish to do so. Typically, one would put their high-speed, fast devices in the beginning of the bus and their slow-speed devices on the end. On Intel systems, access to the bus is centralized and controlled by the chipset. The chipset is a chip that determines who gets to access the bus at any given time, what speed the bus will operate on, 
and what protocol they'll use. There are different chipsets available. And typically, when you buy a processor, you have to buy the appropriate chipset that goes with it. Many computers have more than one bus, particularly if you have devices running at different speeds. You may have your slow devices connected to one bus and your faster devices connected to another bus. And between them, they'll be bridged. A bridge is a device that connects one bus to another. It understands the protocol of both buses and can transfer information from one bus to the other. You may have multiple bridges because you have many different buses that will be connecting one bus to the other. This is a look at how the devices on my computer are connected. If you go out to computer management, look at devices and click on connection. They will show you how your equipment is connected together. And you can see here in this system, we have a PCI bus and it's connected to the bus where that connects the processor. And then to that, there's a, several other bus connections, uh, connection for the IO controller for the SATA serial attachment uh, RAID system. It connects the uh, my Intel solid state hard drive, another rotating hard drive, and my uh, CD-ROM player, DVD. Also, down here, you can see I have a USB controller. The USB controller is connected to the PCI bus and the USB hub is connected to the controller. The USB devices are connected to the hub. And so you can see I have my webcam connected to that. And that's how I can do zoom with my pictures. If I ever turn on my pictures, which I usually don't, you don't want to see me. There are multiple bus standards. In other words, protocols for putting information on the bus. And many computers have multiple different types of buses on them. One of the earliest standards was the ISA bus, the Industry Standard Architecture. And it was used in the first 80, 88 PCs. Uh, it was a 20-bit bus with 20 addresses, address lines. So you could address up to one megabyte of memory. Uh, there were uh, faster buses coming out that and they soon the ISA was upgraded to the extended ISA. They came out with a new bus standard called the PCI, Peripheral Computer Interface, in the early 90s. And that allowed for faster speeds and more data lines. That was upgraded to the PCI Express. And many computers we have today run various versions of the PCI Express or PCIe and it goes significantly faster than earlier devices. Another popular bus system, particularly on Apple systems, is the Small Computer System Interface, or SCSI, or SCSI bus. Uh, comes in variety formats, variety widths. Uh, and there's even a fiber optic version that runs on fiber optics instead of all cross wires. Some systems don't even use buses. Some systems have a switching fabric or a crossbar switch. And this diagram kind of gives an idea of a crossbar switch. You have multiple inputs, multiple outputs. And at any given time, an input can be connected to another output. So you can have, in this case, input N connected to output one, input one connected to output two, input two connected to output three, and so forth, all at the same time. We're in a bus-based system, only one device can be using the bus at a time.